Welcome everyone to the stages of change, how to respond to a loved one, loved one in the addiction cycle, presented by Dr. Crystal Collier. Dr. Collier herself is a person in long-term recovery. She is a therapist, an educator, whose comprehens comprehensive prevention model, which teaches the neurodevelopmental effects of risky behaviors to students, school staff and families was selected for the prevention and education condemnation from the National Council of Alcoholism and Drug Dependence. Dr. Collier received the Torch Bearer Award from the Texas Association of Addiction Professionals. She's also awarded the Outstanding Research Award from the Association of Alternative Peer Groups and voted Counselor of the Year by the Houston Counseling Association. The Hope and Healing Center, an institute in Houston, Texas, granted Dr. Collier a research fellowship to support the completion of her Neuro Whereabouts Guide published in 2020, which I think every parent and teacher should have. Her faux mapping workbook published in 2023 is designed for people who want to map the family of origin patterns that no longer serve them. Since 1991, her clinical work focuses on adolescents and adults suffering from mental illness, behavioral problems, and substance use disorder. Her area of expertise includes adolescent neurodevelopment, prevention programming, parent coaching, addiction, family of origin work, and training new clinicians. And not only is Dr. Collier has achieved all these awards, but she is genuinely an effective educator. And she is one of the coolest doctors I know. So we <laughs> welcome you, Dr. Collier. We look forward to learning from you because so many of our families are worried about our loved ones' addiction to marijuana, who are developing psychosis and hyperemesis or the cyclic vomiting. And we need this information so we can appropriately and effectively respond to their behaviors. Um, and this presentation also, we're glad you're here because it gives our families hope. So we welcome you with open arms and the floor is yours, Dr. Collier. Oh, thank you so much, Aubrey. I so am a big fan girl of yours since I met you back in Houston ages and ages ago. And uh, watching you go through what you've gone through with family members who have addiction. And I have, having been a therapist who works with families and people who have addiction, being a, a person in long-term recovery myself and gone through it, I have a lot of empathy and understanding for what you're going through, have gone through. And I just love that Every Brain Matters utilizes a lot of my stuff. So thank you so much. Okay, here's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about the stages of change, how to respond to loved ones in the addiction cycle. The next time we meet, part two of this is going to be all about motivational interviewing. So today we're going to go through the stages. The next time we meet, we're going to talk about very specific things you can, should, should not say and do for each stage. And so... Um, Okay, we got this. We're recording. Oh, yep. Okay, good. I want to make sure this gets this gets recorded. So I, I you guys heard about uh, my book, The Neuro Whereabouts Guide. Please know, you guys, that I spent four years of a fellowship writing this book. I wrote it in infographic style so that it would be fun to read. What this book does is it tracks 18 different high-risk behavior and how they affect the brain including marijuana, which is one of the drugs. Uh, I took that out from the illicit drug list because I wanted to really focus specifically on that one because we're seeing such surges of it going up. As you guys know, as perceived harms go down, risk and use go up. And that is what we're seeing in our country with, I think, what, 38 states that have medicinal, 26 states that have recreational use laws. And it's going to take us, uh, you know, another 10 to 20 years of being the guinea pig before we see some of those laws being reversed or uh, some sort of uh, regulation in the system that actually works. So in the meantime, you have to be your child's frontal lobe until they grow one of their own. And so um, 
what I always say treatment wise is if you're working with a kiddo uh, who has addiction uh, under the age of 25, my recommendation is to do everything that you possibly can, no matter what stage of change they're in. Spending your treatment dollars then is wise because the brain is still growing and developing. Now, after the age of 25, the brain is grown and developed and continuing to, sp to support adult children when they're clean and sober and setting good, healthy boundaries for that is what I recommend. Never easy, ever, ever, ever. <clears throat> so what I have found is that when families really understand the stage of change they're in and their child is in, it can help set boundaries in a different way. It also can change expectations and hopes, which is one of the hardest things to juggle, is to figure out what to do, where you start, where you stop, where is their hula hoop, where is mine, and how to get out of theirs when it's not being effective. So that's really the focus of what we're going to talk about today. So in my work, I looked at 18 different high-risk behavior and how they affect the brain. And so what we know is that anything that increases dopamine levels has the power to shut off the frontal lobe if it goes above a, a specific threshold. Marijuana is one of the worst because it has such a long half-life. When a teenager uses alcohol, their frontal lobe is off for two, three days in various shapes and forms. But marijuana's half-life is anywhere from one week up to six weeks, depending upon how much someone uses. That can shut the frontal lobe off longer, having even more a negative effect on increasing executive or on those growing executive functioning skills. And so when we think about change, you know, what I want you to think about is what do you want to change? What do you want your child to change? And if you can, uh, what I'd love for it to invite you to do is to actually just jot that down on a piece of paper. Think of something that you are struggling to change or something that you'd really, really like to change about yourself. And then, of course, if you're here listening because you have a kiddo who's using substances, write down what you'd like them to change. And it may be uh, being sober or being in recovery or just reducing their use, uh, harms use, whatever that is. I want you to focus in on what it is that you want to change about yourself and what you want your loved one to change. Okay, so oh, change. I don't know if you guys have heard that old joke. What are the two things that humans hate the most? Well, the first one, obviously, is change. And the second one is the way things are, right? Like we have, <laughs> have um, such an innate need for structure and keeping things the way they are. And we go through a lot of different stages that help us move into change. Now, there are some people, I'm a Gemini. I love change. I love having lots of new things to do every day. Uh, and it's funny because when I don't have tons of things to do, that's when I start getting bored and antsy. But there are a, a lot of people out there are very different in that way or very opposite in that way. I was actually just at a school this morning talking about little kids, kin kindergarten through fifth. And it was funny because they said about 40 percent of kids struggle so much with flexible thinking, moving from one activity to the next. And they were asking me, what can we do about that? And I said, well, accept it, validate it, because there are kids out there who just don't like change and they don't flex very easily. That's OK. They are probably always going to be that way their whole entire life. And so to help validate that and help them cope with that is important. One of my clients, he's about 26 years old. He has been, excuse me, he has been struggling really, really hard to quit marijuana. He got four days the first time he tried. And I asked him, you know, what what is going on? He said, oh, I was bored. And it, and I was said, like, tell me about boredom. He's like, it's so painful to be bored. And, you know, this kiddo does not know how to regulate when he's bored. This is not a skill that he has. 
And so being bored dysregulates him and it feels like too much change. And so in order to distract himself from that very, very painful feeling, he uses. And of course, unfortunately, he's become addicted and now goes through withdrawals and um, uh, lots of cravings. And so there's the other reason why he uses. Uh, but I'm going to tell you guys the old parable story about the six blind men and the elephant. This is a really, really old Indian study or uh, parable. The parable goes that there were six blind men who were asked to identify an elephant, and each one of them grabbed a different part of the elephant and came up with six different conclusions. The man who grabbed the rope, or sorry, the tail, thought it was a rope. The man who touched his torso thought it was a brick wall. The man who touched his ear thought it was a big fan. The man who touched his leg thought it was a tree. Of course, the man who thought who touched the tusk thought it was, a, you know, a spear. And then the man who touched the trunk thought it was a snake. And so I love this parable because it really helps me remember that every single person is going to see an issue differently. This is really hard when you're a parent. You can clearly see it's an elephant. It's right. You know exactly what harms is going on, what's happening. But when the person has a different perspective or only sees parts of it, it takes time for them to be able to see the whole picture. And so uh, it, there's an old saying that when um, a person's will is changed against their will, they're of the same will still. I think it's really important to remember that that pulling somebody into, no, 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 this is an elephant, when they are not ready to see it is an ineffective way of exerting or trying to move them into change. And those of you guys who go to Al-Anon, you probably get this uh, quite a lot. But when I think about a, a whole person, I don't just think about their thoughts, their feelings, and their actions, but I think about the systems that they are included in. What stages of change are they in? What is their neurobiology? What is their genetics? What are their interpersonal patterns? What is their attachment style with different family members? What social systems and supports are they connected to or not connected to? And then, of course, what is their cultural context? How does this factor in to why or why not they, they don't want to go through this change or why they entered into the behavior in the first place? And so from this perspective, knowing that we are involved in lots of systems, I've got a, a, a kid right now who just got back from treatment. His parents are very, very simply not going to pay for any more college until he proves that he's been sober for a long period of time. And he is blowing up their phone with lots of emotionally abusive texts right now. And he's trying to get them to believe that his fraternity is his family, a loving, supportive family that will help him not do the things that he wants. <laughs> this is a very powerful cultural context for this kiddo. Now, I think his parents get that this is an emotional manipulation and they're not going to fall for it, but they keep needing me to reassure them that this is not a good idea to let them go back into the fraternity and pay for another semester of school. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the neuroscience of addiction and then we'll go into each stage of change. So remember that from birth to about age 11, 12, we grow 200 billion, billion neurons in our brain. It's like we get this big chunk of clay. And we don't know what our adult brain is going to look like. But when we hit puberty, we start going through a, a second stage of brain development. When we start getting rid of cel cells, we start actually sculpting this brain into what will be our adult masterpiece. Now, we end up with 100 billion neurons left over, but those neurons are really well connected with dendrites. And most of those thick connected networks happen right in front of the brain in the frontal lobe. And what 
we do as they grow and develop is thicken those connections. Those connections, as you can see right there behind the forehead, halfway up the skull, are connected to our executive functioning skills. That is what our frontal lobe does for us. And they grow according to those two phases. So the first phase from birth to about 11, 12 is when we grow lower level executive functioning skills. These are the skills that we need to get up in the morning, get out the door on time, remembering our lunch. Then we hit about 11, 12 years old. And as we start to grow in executive functioning skills, those higher level skills, what happens is that we end up growing what we need to grow up, get out of our parents' house, becoming a fully self-supporting functioning adult. Higher level skills are what we need to actually relate and communicate in a healthy, mature way. The number one predictor of adult success is impulse control. No matter how much money you make or how smart you are, if you don't have good self-control, you are going to struggle. And this is one of the hardest things about working with kids who are addicted to substances. Many of them are incredibly smart and incredibly dynamic, but they make dumb choices and decisions. I totally relate. That's what I did when I was a kid. And so these skills suffer. When the frontal lobe is off because of drugs, alcohol, substances, uh, uh, process addictions, those are behavioral addictions, chronic depression, chronic anxiety, it doesn't get to grow these skills. So we may even have deficits in the earlier skills if we started engaging in an addiction earlier, like what we're seeing in technology addiction, which happens much, much earlier. Okay, now, when the frontal lobe is off, it's really important to remember that, let me get to the next slide, there we go, that we can't reason, we can't try to motivate, cajole, mm, beg, lots of frothy emotional appeals. They're just not going to work here. This is a classic study that I have in my book that I reference all the time. It is a functional MRI study that looks from the top of the brain down into the brain. And what you see on the top three slides is a person who's completely sober, no drugs, no alcohol in their system. And you see the brain taken one second apart. So you can kind of see over time what's happening. The frontal lobes are right there at the top in red, the red means there's more activity. The guy at the bottom is either high or he's in withdrawal, active detox. And what you see is that the limbic system in the back and in the middle there is lit up, literally lit up, too much dopamine or too much fear if it's depression or anxiety and the frontal lobe shuts off. Now, what we want to make sure that we do is only talk to our loved ones when their frontal lobe is on. When somebody is high or they're in withdrawal, they are not going to have the part of the brain that has empathy, connection, problem solving, decision making, emotion regulation on. So talking to somebody when they're actively using is a terrible idea. Setting a boundary and a limit is where we should go. Okay. So now we kind of know what the brain science is. Let's talk about the stages. So remember that these are usually linear, but they don't have to be. We can move in and out of these at various times. And so I'm going to use two of the changes that I've made in my life and then bring in client issues to kind of illustrate this. So I've been sober from drugs and alcohol since February 3rd, 89. I just celebrated an anniversary. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, but I didn't quit smoking cigarettes. I was a pack a day camel smokers from about 12 years old all the way up to 34. And so when I was 34, I went and got a hypnosis and I finally quit smoking. And I've been smoke free since then. Another one was when I wanted to change jobs. Oh my God, it was so scary and so hard. Uh, and it took me a long time to finally make the decision. So I'm gonna use those two as a backdrop. So let's talk about our first 
phase. Pre-contemplation is really literally what that is. Before we're thinking about the change. Now, when we're in this place, we are it's just not on our radar. We don't have any intention of changing. We don't see that on the foreseeable future. We're not interested in getting help because we don't think there's a problem. And a lot of times we're pretty defensive of even bad habits that we have. We don't believe that we um, that this is an issue and we're really just not interested in getting help. We also may enlist others to defend our position. Okay, so when I think about smoking, I remember being in AA uh, because I've been going to meetings the whole time. And most of the meetings back then were smoking. I remember this old um, uh, house that I would go to meetings in. And I would always, like, I'd put my head against the, the wall and my hair would stick to it because there was so much tar on the wall from all the, I know, gross, right? All those people smoking for all those years because we smoked in meetings. And I remember thinking, well, everybody else smokes. Like, you know, I, yeah, I know this is gross. I don't like how my um, uh, clothes uh, uh, smell, but most of my friends smoke. I love going out after meetings and staying up all night at the coffee shop and smoking cigarettes. Like this is not an issue. Um, and, and, and it really wasn't in my uh, early 20s. It was something that I really enjoyed doing. I hope you guys out there are not like craving nicotine from me talking about this if you're an ex-smoker too. Um, but it just was not on the issue. Now, when I was thinking about my job, you know, I really loved this. My, my first job as a therapist, I was there for eight years and I absolutely just loved, loved, loved it. But the path, the, the last two years of that job, we had a lot of change. There was absolutely tons of change and it wasn't great change for me. So I started to feel uncomfortable, but I so loved working at this treatment center and working with the kids. I really didn't want to change. So it was not on my radar. I just started feeling some discomfort in my own skin. Now, what's important to remember here is that usually this is when we have the most resistance in our clients and in our children and our partners, whomever we want to change. And latent, excuse me, um, resistance can have lots of faces, right? So in the, the therapy world, it might be they come late to session um, or they avoid talking about hard things. Some of my clients will wait to the last five minutes of the session to bring up a big whopper of an issue. You know, there's resistance to talking about it. Our kids may start missing school, avoiding certain classes or work. This is when we see a lot of blaming. Oh, well, it's not my fault. It's their fault. This is when we see uh, the lack of effort uh, starting to creep in. You know, we just do a little less. I remember that last two years of my job, I was just kind of, I just wouldn't work as hard as I had been before, right? You know, and um, my anger and hostility went up. With kids, we see a lot of anger and hostility in this stage. It is uh, all about like, you can't change me. You can't change my mind. Marijuana is a medicine. I take this for my anxiety. There's nothing that you can say that can talk me out of this, even though you can see years and years and years of research that says it actually increases anxiety. Uh, they're, they're in the face of incontrovertible evidence. If they're in pre-contemplation, it's not going to sink in. And a lot of times what you see with kids at this age is they may either talk too much, da -da -da -da, like uh, uh, the parent that I was talking about um, earlier just sent me this huge long text that her child sent her and very abusive, just yucky and nastiness. I think it's really important when your kids are in this stage and they're doing that to set very firm limits. The limit that I would encourage people to set is what I told her is I'm not gonna read anything that's longer than three sentences. I'm just gonna delete it and move on. Do not read that. Do not allow it in. Don't engage with it. Set healthy limits. Sometimes kids talk too little. They shut down. They stop talking to you. They stop sharing with you, which is even harder, I think, sometimes than getting the emotional abuse because you don't know what's going on. Our brain needs to know what's happening. And when it doesn't, the amygdala lights up and puts us in a hypervigilant you know, state. 
I think people here are the most defensive and cleverly defensive, especially kids whose frontal lobes are still developing abstract reasoning. They come up with the most marvelous, but you know, like ludicrous uh, intellectualizations, right? You know, it's just so interesting to to listen to all of the excuses that kids can come up with here and make it sound so good, right? I mean. One of my clients tried to list like 10 things to convince her mother to get her a, a smartphone and she's only in the seventh grade. And I mean, it was all so convincing. Her mom brought it in, was kind of freaking out. Like, am I debilitating my kid? And look at all these things. Like, you know, they came from websites and like, okay, yeah. Well, <laughs> so a lot of uncooperative tangential trying to you know oh well what about this over here but you know just really not sticking to the point or you might see a lot of people pleasing behavior this is really common in couples you know there's a partner maybe who wants to continue doing something they overcompensate they know you don't want them they don't that you don't want them to do that and so they'll do it secretively or surreptitiously and do a lot of people pleasing for you on the front end very difficult stage to be in but as you can see by this icon pulling on the donkey right? It just, it's not good for you. It's not good for the donkey. It's just not the way to go. So engaging in power struggles. Okay, you guys, this is my uh, favorite illustration. I actually have this in the book. Engaging in a power struggle with somebody who's, in, that, who's using drugs or alcohol, trying to, to use whatever method that you can to talk them out of engaging in the behavior. It's just never a good idea because once a kid puts a power struggle worm in the water and you bite, you are the fish on the hook. They are the fishermen in control of you. What we don't want to do is have them practice that, practice these really great ways of reeling you in and manipulating. They grow literally long networks of neurons in their brain for doing that. What we want to be able to do is stop stop talking. And the way that we do that is what I call affectionately using duct tape therapy. Literally, mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. you stop talking at that point and being able to set a limit and say, I'm, I'm done with this conversation. I'm leaving. I love you, but I'm done. I just don't want to uh, have this conversation. You know the answer. You know what I feel like. I, I respect that you and your hula hoop is your decisions, your life. But if you want to live in my house, here are the rules. Or if you want to have a, a healthy relationship with me, here's what I request. Literally learning how to set boundaries and not bite the power struggle worms. Okay, so let me kind of pause here for a second. Anybody have a thought or a question that, that you want to um, ask about here? Please feel free to just unmute and interrupt me at any time. I have a question. Please. How do you not bite on the uh, people pleasing worm? Uh, like when they want to people please you? Right. As a distraction. As a distraction. As a form of right. resistance. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, that's a hard one because maybe you really, really want to be people pleased at that moment. <laughs> but I, I think validation would be the healthiest thing to do is to be able to say, I really appreciate you wanting to take care of me or do this for me right now, but I'm also worried and concerned that this might be a distraction from really what I need or want. So a lot of really good I statements and boundary setting, but also a good validation sandwich. So re remember, like my favorite validation sandwich is when I've said to this one kid, dude, I really get that smoking weed is so important for you. You know so much about all the strains. This is really something that is important for you, but it's not going to change my mind about uh, the harms of, of use. And I think your parents are not going to let you use while you're living in their house. But man, I'm so sorry about this because I know it's really important to you. That is like a classic validation sandwich. And it's much easier 
for a person in the pre-contemplation stage or that, you know, does a lot of, um, uh, of this power struggling with you, just to let go of the power struggle when they feel at least heard and seen. Now, I think if it's a kid, this is one of the hardest things to do because parents think they're agreeing. Validation is not agreeing. You can say to somebody, hey, I don't think it's cool, but I really see that you think it's cool. This is important to you. I get it. I disagree, but that's me. That's my hula hoop. Uh, but I really see you and I hear you is a really important tool to use when somebody is in the pre-contemplation stage. Great question, Stacy. Thank you. Okay. Any more, please just unmute and interrupt me. I'm serious. I do not mind that at all. But I'm going to go to our next stage of change, contemplation. So this is when we start thinking about it. But all we're doing is thinking about it. This is a great place to be, though, because we're aware that a problem exists. So this happened for me when I got my first case of bronchitis diagnosed when I was about 26 years old. My pack a day of camels that I'd been smoking since I was roughly about 12, 13, 14 was really taking a toll. Every time I got sick, I stayed sick longer because of smoking. Now, I wasn't really sure the extent of the issue, and this is kind of the hallmark of contemplation. We Nobody wants to grow up and be an addict, right? Nobody. And so you you think a lot, well, am I? Well, I don't think I am. Well, this is, you know, I wonder how hard it would be, uh, but I don't know, vacillating in and out of denial. Oh, no, 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 I'm not as bad as so-and-so over there. Like they have this, this, and this. I've, I haven't gotten there yet. We also see a lot of ambivalence here. Mm, just not sure, don't know. They are not considering change anytime soon. This is why it is critical to not use change talk in pre-contemplation or contemplation. What we wanna do is stay firmly in our hula hoop. I don't like it. It's not okay in my house. I need this. I want that. Those kind of places. As soon as you jump into their hula hoop and say, I think you should change this. Well, I think it's your marijuana use. Well, you know, it, you wouldn't be vomiting if you, if you quit smoking marijuana. Like, do not jump into their hula hoop. It is a violation of their boundary and where they are, but it's really important that you state what you need and what you want to live as healthy as you can. Now, as soon as you jump in and start using change talk, they're going to be resistant. They don't want to lose control. This is a precarious stage of change. This feels really scary to be in this stage. And I remember when I started thinking, man, I think I really want to look for another job. <gasps> oh, that was so scary for me. I knew what my paycheck was. It was guaranteed every couple of weeks. It was scary to think about doing something different. A and then there were times when I'm like, nope, 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 not even going to consider that because it was just so scary and made me feel out of control. But this is also a great stage because this is when we really seriously start to consider, okay, maybe I could actually make a change. But remember, contemplation is definitely not an action-oriented stage. And so when we're here, this is a tool that I like to use. Uh, it, it's called the readiness ruler. And, and you guys can see, like, where am I in this stage? Like, what is my temperature? What am I ready to do at this stage? I'm really not ready to do anything except just think about this. I'm just going to keep pondering it and wondering about that, weighing the pros and cons and seeing. Now, that's a good question to use when somebody is here. Well, what would be the pro of quitting? What would be some cons of quitting? Here, I get a lot of resistance from parents because the last thing you want to do is ask them, ask them about the cons. In your mind, there aren't any cons, right? But this is a really great, I mean, you guys know that when somebody starts talking about politics, if you can feel what side, right, of the aisle they're on, your brain starts to shut off. But if you are talking about politics with somebody who mentions both sides pretty equally and stays uh, very reflective and open to both arguments, you can stay in that conversation longer. And so that's really the best tactic here. 
is like, you know, are you ready to do anything? That's okay. I'll meet you where you are. Although I just want you to hear, if you want to be here, uh, no, no marijuana use or I uh, can't do this when I'm around you because that's just my boundary. Like being able to set really healthy boundaries here is important, although really very difficult and not easy. Okay, so that was contemplation. Let's go to the next stage of preparation. What is really important to remember here is that when people are in the preparation stage of change, they still have not changed. They still have not done anything to change except making a commitment. That may be all they're ready to do. And I remember that when I finally had a couple years of chronic bronchitis, that's when I thought, okay, I have to quit. I cannot continue smoking and expect to be a healthy adult with healthy lungs. And I remember seeing this um, study that showed the black lungs that you get from tar. After seven years, they were nice and pink again. Our lungs heal themselves, but it takes a long time. And I kept thinking about that over and over and over, that I want my lungs to be nice and pink and healthy. And when I was thinking about changing, when I finally said, I think it was something weird my boss said, and I was like, okay, universe, thank you for giving me the sign. I think I need to go. Like I was really ready to grow. And so that's when I made a commitment to look. All I did was look. I still didn't tell anybody that I was looking for a job. I just thought, okay, I'm going to start looking on my own. Now, this is when spontaneous change talk happens. Like, I wonder what would happen if I did this, or wonder what would happen if I did that, or I wonder what would be this. That's really cool. When your loved one starts engaging in spontaneous change talk, that's when you stop what you're doing and say, tell me more. The three magic words, tell me more. What do you mean? Tell me more. Instead of, oh my God, I'm so glad you're doing that or saying that. Uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh. We don't want to engage in that kind of change talk with them, but we want to just have them continuing because remember, they haven't changed yet. And so in my preparation for quitting smoking, I researched smoking cessation. I even talked to my doctor about it. And uh, she told me about a lot of different methods. And interesting, I actually went and bought the patch. And it sat on my dining room table for about 18 months. <laughs> so I was in this preparation stage for a very long time, but I was doing research to figure out what is the best way to do this. I started looking at those um, uh, of, of numbers because there was still a number back then. I remember even called a quit smoking number and talked to somebody. This guy was really, really sweet, but I wasn't ready yet. I was still resistant to taking action, but I was making these little small changes to test the water. So instead of waking up and lighting up a camel cigarette first thing in the morning, I would wait. I would wait. I would drink some water. I would wait until I felt like, okay, I can't wait anymore. A little changes. I would stop uh, smoking in my car or until I like really couldn't anymore. I would try to figure out, okay, when can I do this? I was gathering information. So when your loved one is doing this, you can help. You can help gather information. Like, do you want me to do some research on this? Do you want me to find a treatment center that might fit you? I found a few. Here's some for you to look at. Just gathering information and being helpful. But remember, their readiness to take action is building. There's not a lot you can do to make this go faster, unfortunately. And this is one of the hardest stages for family members to be in. Because you're impatient. You know, like time is ticking here. You need them to get healthy faster. Okay. Once they finally decide to change, like whoop, they are in action. Now, when you see somebody in action, their motivation is usually at a pinnacle. They're actively taking steps to change. Their resistance really, really is low. They're much more open to help and feedback, seeking information and help. Intention is to continue moving forward. This is when they're starting to acquire new skills and they're practicing healthier behaviors. 
most important thing to do here is cheerlead. Now, a lot of times I see parents do this. They say things like, well, God, it's about time. I mean, you've been torturing me with this for years. Worst thing to do when somebody is in the action stage. You will have a moment at your family group, if they're in treatment, to share how their behavior affected you. My, my advice is to withhold until then. And once they're in the action stage, really reward them. I'm so proud of you. I'm so glad you made this. How does it feel? Are you proud of yourself? What's happening for you? Tell me more about this change. And, and really being able to praise them for how they're showing up for you in a different way. Like, I really appreciated you were more empathic to me than I've seen you in a long time. Thank you so much. Um, remember, we really want to cheerlead here. Okay. Once someone has continued the change for at least six months, they have officially moved in the maintenance stage. Their resistance is really, really low. They've admitted they need to change. They're working on that actively. They are building new structure in for their change. They might even be more open to receiving your help or even feedback at that point. This is a really great time to be in continued family therapy. And they're seeking more information, like how else can I maintain this? Their intention is to continue moving forward. Now, what is important to remember here is that when they truly move into maintenance, their identity is shifting. And so this is one of the best things that you can do is reinforce this new, who the, you know, the, the new you, right? Who they are. This is who I am now. And I remember when I was in recover, early recovery and they would give out chips at the meeting, I could not wait to get the next chip. Like I was hanging on every day to get the green one and the gold one and the perfect purple one. And when I got to a year, I was so pissed and disappointed because the next chip wasn't until 18 months. So I had to wait six more months to get that positive, right? But this is what we need. We need a lot of cheerleading. We need, uh, you know, that first six months, the relapse rates at three months are 90%. Relapse rates at six months are 70%. The relapse rate at one year for drugs and alcohol is 50%. You got a 50-50 shot of maintaining sobriety at one year. And so being uh, your identity shifting, this is when old habits are actively avoided. I remember um, I didn't want to go out to um, uh, bars anymore with friends, even if it was to shoot pool. I just was not comfortable at that point. And when I started to make the change and actively got a new job, and the first six months were so hard because the structure was different, the responsibilities were different. But after I started settling in, this was who I was. I had moved up into a, a more management position and it felt really good. My skill acquisition was growing. I was feeling a lot of pride and accomplishment when I finally quit smoking. It was really interesting because I was getting married and I was really hoping to get pregnant. And so the idea of smoking while pregnant was just atrocious to me. And so I wanted to do anything I possibly could. So I reached out to a therapist. I finally got a hypnosis session. But I had when I got into my car, I had one cigarette in the pack left. And I really, really, really wanted to. But I prayed and I had this moment of, nope, and I broke it and that was it. And I moved on. And it took a, a good, you know, 12 days for the major withdrawal symptoms to go away. But it took me a good six to nine months to not be a smoker anymore, to get rid of all the ashtrays, to get rid of the smells. I even moved into a new place, leave all those smells behind. This is when our loved ones are applying new coping mechanisms. They're cultivating new support systems. I stopped going to smoking meetings at that time, which was great because the laws were changing. So there were less of them. Um, but I started applying um, uh, 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 skills in a more flexible way. That first six months, it was like, uh-uh, I have to do this. I can't do that. 
And and that's really very typical for people in early recovery. They got to go to 90 meetings in 90 days. They got to do exactly what their sponsor tells them to do. Following every rule concretely, perfectly is pretty important here. And uh, But when you start to move into maintenance, you can be more flexible with this. Okay, the last stage is optional. Relapse. We don't have to go all the way back to the very beginning. We can relapse and pop right back into preparation or action. This is when we slip back into old habits. We've been resting on our laurels. Maybe we stop going to meetings and those little teeny tiny behaviors start popping in and then we go on a slippery slope. This is when the stress of triggers gets too strong and we go back into, uh, one of my sponsees just quit vaping she was 12 days in and she had a really bad day and she found a vape pen and she relapsed. This is when our coping mechanisms just are not strong enough yet. And you don't, like I said, you don't have to start the stages all over. You can go right back in. The most important thing to do here, again, is validate and set boundaries and limits. And to be able to say, what can I do to help, but only help in a way that is healthy for you. Okay. When somebody relapses, they are full of guilt, shame, exhaustion, helplessness, and they feel really defeated. And so one of the negative things that we can do is to shame them, guilt them, blame them, but ask them, tell me how you're feeling. What does this mean for you? And they may move back into denial or some sort of a protective measure for this. Okay, so I want you to think about other questions that you have as I kind of move into what I think that we should do to take care of ourselves. So everything in my book, The Neuro Whereabouts Guide, has also been made into a video that is on knowyourneuro.org. All of them are developmentally appropriate for three age groups, lots of one-page activities. I encourage you to go there. There is a family page that can help uh, get you resources that you need from there about all of the topics and skills. And if you love the website, you want other people or school districts to use it, and you want more things, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm making new videos all the time. Now, uh, Aubrey mentioned my Foo Mapping book. Uh, Foo Mapping is a process that I've been doing in therapy for a really long time that helps you map the neural networks that were created for thinking, feeling, and behavior patterns that you learned as your brain was growing and developing. If you grew up in an alcoholic system or a system with mental health or uh, drug abuse issues, you most likely will have a foo button. Here's mine. Mine is actually right here on my chest, right? And so um, it's really important to know what your foo button is because once it's pushed, you get regressed into that childlike state think, feel, and act out what you learned how to do then to cope. Those usually don't really work well for us in our healthy adult relationships. So I always recommend doing your foo mapping, doing your own work. If you have a loved one who is struggling with any kind of an addiction issue. Okay, so that was me. I've left about 10 minutes. This is one hour, right, Aubrey? Yes, and we can go a few okay. minutes over if you have the time. Okay. But we I, want to yes. respect your time. Yes, I can too. Oh no, no, I've got plenty of time. Uh, so, what what questions do you guys have for me about any of this or anything else? Yeah, I'm, this is Bart. Uh, thanks so much, Well, um, So, if someone is sixteen years old in your home, so obviously not eighteen or older, and your boundaries and your hula hoop says you know no use and all that uh, in our home, what, what's your suggestion? Ah, well, hopefully you have a really good clinician. Okay, because you do not have to make this decision on your own. Working with a therapist who specializes in, in teenagers that age and drug use is really important. And letting them know that uh, you're going to need to potentially create a behavior contract. And remembering behavior contracts fail. They are designed to fail. But you got to keep setting limits. Can't use, can't use while you're living with me. I'm not going to give you any money unless it's to go see a therapist or to quit, to help you quit, whether that be treatment, a recovery program, whatever you choose to do to stop using, I will support you. 
but I'm going to not support any other efforts. And so I have helped families create behavior contracts. Some of them are, are wild. I mean, I had a kid once, this was a, a, about 10 years ago. His dad smoked weed and smoked with him, a divorced household. Mom was very much against it, knew the science, talked to the kid about the science. But of course, the kid wants to do what he thinks is the, the good thing with his, his dad. And so, but his dad didn't pay any child support. And mom said, if you want to keep living with me, you cannot use. And here are your consequences. And we, I mean, we took every privilege away from that kid, including his door, including his Harry Potter books. <laughs> this, this will date this case. He, he was like 15, 16 years old. And the only thing he loved was Harry Potter. You could take away everything else for him. But he didn't care about his friends. He didn't care about, you know, phones, computers, anything like that. But once, once, I mean, it was bare minimum and he dug in for six months, but his mom just kept validating him. I kept validating her and supporting her because she, you know, her husband, ex-husband was the antithesis of support. And then it was eventually, finally, the next Harry Potter book came out and she wouldn't buy it for him until he agreed to stop smoking. And he finally did. He earned all of his privileges back one by one by one and eventually stopped going to dad's. It was a very, very long wow. process. Please know that that happened, you know, when marijuana was not as potent as it is today. So get as much help and support as you possibly can to set the best limits you can. Now, if a kid decides to run away and leave home, you what I recommend is calling the police in your area just to let them know. So that if he, if they pick him up as a runaway, they'll at least bring them back to you, but making sure they get into some sort of a rehabilitation program and are, and you set really healthy boundaries, cannot live in this house using, do whatever you can to protect that brain while it's growing and developing. Great. Did Thank you. Have you. A follow -up question? Yes. Thank you. That's great. Thanks. such a complicated issue. And that's why working with a professional like Dr. Collier is so important because it can change on a daily basis. But I love the way you say, what is the consequence to your behavior? I think a lot of parents think, oh, we got to kick them out, you know, and I, I don't want to kick them out, you know, and, and, and they, they have this tug of war of emotions and what do we do? And then they get these mixed messages that, there's, oh, there's really nothing you can do. And that's not true. That's why, you know, we are so excited that Dr. Collier is giving us these resources and tools to allow us to know there are things we can do. And it doesn't need to be a crisis. It can be approached gently and lovingly and clearly. So, you know, I know that clear, be clear, be kind, be gone with the boundary and the consequences is real. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and, and a, lot, a lot of times what I learned over the years, just to not talk over anybody who wants to ask a question, but a lot of times a consequence when a child is not stopping their marijuana use, it's a red flag that they need more support, a higher level of care. And that is the consequence that could be a consequence to their using. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And I know that um, every brain matters has my levels of use yeah. on the website. And so I please, if you're not sure what to do, use the levels of use to determine. The levels of care will correspond to a level of use, right? So if somebody is in the experimentation phase, they don't need rehab, right? They need a therapist. They need some counseling. If they're in the dependence phase, that's when they need rehab, but you may not be able to afford that. You may have to have an IOP experience. Like there's a lot of a big list there of what the different level um, uh, care actions that you would take depending upon somebody's level of use. So in this instance, we also need to think, what is my child's stage of change? What can I get them to do? What am I going to have to force as a limit and I think what's really cool about knowing the stages of change is if you have to force a kid into some sort of a treatment episode and they're in the pre-contemplation or contemplation, your expectations can shift. And so you may not want to spend 
a lot of money on the first rehab because they're only in the pre-contemplation stage, uh, you know, but when they're in prep and they're like, I really need help. That is when you can maybe shell out a little bit more for that Meadows experience or, you know, something that um, might be um, a little bit more expensive. Yeah. We are getting wonderful comments in the chat. This okay. this recording will be on the Every Brain Matters YouTube channel, hopefully by next week, if not sooner, because I know this information is so valuable. I will get it up as soon as I can. Um, also, join us for part two next week of motivational interviewing with Dr. Collier. It'll tie in a lot of what she taught today. And then there's a question, what are the percentages for success at the three months, six months, in one year, I think uh, the percentage of relapsing at those stages you mentioned, can you repeat that? I, I can, and I can put that graph into the next week's presentation too, so that you can see it. But at three months, we're looking at 90% relapse rate. At six months, you're looking at 70% relapse rate. At one year, 50%. And at 18 months, 20%. There's a statistically significant drop in the percentage risk because that corresponds to when the frontal lobe turns back on. It takes about 18 months. That means you're, you know, six months is maintenance, right? So times three, somebody's really made an identity change and their brain is really turned back on. And that is when those relapse rates drop to about 20%. But here is what I love and hate all in the same moment is that once you get to five years of recovery, your relapse rate drops to the 15th percentile. And so that stays that way for the rest of your sobriety. Because once you've made those structural changes to your brain, you can't unmake them. Once an addict, unfortunately, always an addict. Once you've met those criteria and made those changes. So that helps me remember that I have to stay in the middle of the herd. You know, I can't be on the edge. I can't, I gotta, I have to have a validation uh, I, I, no, I count my, my accountability sandwich, my sponsor and then my sponsees, you know, in between there, I'm going to stay accountable to somebody. And that helps me continue to go to meetings, continue to work a program and continue to make sure that sobriety is at the forefront of my life. Even at 35, wait, 34 years sober, which is what I just turned, uh, or did I turn 35? Golly, I can't remember how sober I am. Uh, 34. I, uh, no, 35. Oh, you're 35. So I you saw back. you. I saw you posted on Facebook. You're 35. I'm 35. Oh my God. That's so funny. Yes. Uh, math, math challenge. Uh, but at 35 years sober, uh, it's really like that date is so important to me. I'm not going to lose it for anything, but I also know that I can lose it really easily. I could walk out this door and go use today and it's gone. And so what do I need to do to make sure that I have sobriety, uh, um, emotional sobriety, to so that I stay really well supported? And as you guys know that, uh, you know, one hit wonders, only 10% of people who get into recovery actually stay sober the first time. About 70% of people who get into recovery relapse chronically before they actually stay sober for a long period of time. And then of course, you know, that leaves about 20%. And 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 you guys sadly know that either jails or or death are are the the potential end result of, of addiction. So what we want to try to do is meet people where they are, which is all about stages of change. And next time we'll talk about very specific things. So motivational interviewing, this is an actual clinical tool that uh therapists are trained in to use for people who are in a various stage of change. I'm going to teach you guys how to use that as a parent or a loved one. Awesome. And also, Crystal, you mentioned about your your recovery family members who, you know, the every brain matters community, I'm sure Dr. Collier would agree with this too. We encourage you all to work your own program, recovery program, outside of your loved ones, meaning you get a sponsor. You work the steps and develop your own sponsees that you can learn from. There you go. Do your mapping. Yes. Like know, yeah, know what behaviors are not working for you or your family members. And what I love about this is um, this is a workbook. So you can do it on your own or you can do it with a therapist. Uh, you can find all this stuff on Amazon, uh, including my new books, kids books that are out. 
called Know Your Neuro Adventures of a Growing Brain. And this is the first one that teaches kids about the superhero, Neuro. And then there's uh, all the books that will come after our Adventures of Neuro. You can go uh, watch how Neuro says no, how Neuro sets boundaries, how Neuro feels feelings, how Neuro accepts their body. Like all of the basic skills that we want kids to learn and need to learn earlier and earlier. Please go take a look. And I can see more uh, us having Dr. Collier back for more topics um, because I think I am more hungry for this information. And I bet many of the families here are too. And sure. we have Marinon available now too for families affected by another person's marijuana use. So we have Bart Bright and Mary Moss on the, the uh, meeting today who are leading leader founding members of that group. So join us there. Um, we have 11 or 12 meetings a week now. It's crazy. It's sad that it's growing, but we are grateful that we are finding hope and healing there. Um, here, do you see the a question from um, in the chat? Um, it says, I have a 57-year-old sister who is homeless, uses meth, has had a lifelong substance use disorder. She will call me when she is at a moment of clarity, but not sure how to approach her about rehab, which she has been through many times. I try to give her a taste of normal when I'm with her, uh, when I'm with her without judgment. That's a beautiful way of saying it. And first of all, let me say, I'm so sorry that you have to see your sister go through this. It's the most painful thing. And I effing hate addiction. I mean, I just, so many of my family members, uh, you know, I lost my uncle to cirrhosis and I've watched so many people surrounding him in deep, unhealthy codependency. So for you to, like when she reaches out, being able to say, what are you ready for? What do you need? A gauge her stage of change. Meth is an 1100% increase in um, dopamine. And to give you an example, uh, food increases dopamine 100%. And so it makes the most amazing structural changes. It can take up to five years for the brain to turn back on for your average meth user or addict. So this can be a potentially a lifelong issue for her. Um, and uh, what a lot of times we see, especially for meth, is that the triggers are just so vast. And sometimes people have to move to a completely new place and, and just to, to get the slate clean for that. So offering her a little taste of normal, I think, is a beautiful way of saying it. Uh, you know, my father was a homeless person almost his entire life. And my husband and I would go to Vegas. He lived in a tunnel underneath Las Vegas Boulevard. And we went to go visit him. And I would always get a big suite. So he'd have a shower to take, you know, and he'd stay in the extra room. And we just gave him a little bit of taste of normalcy, got him cleaned up. I never gave him money because I knew he would be using it on meth, which was his drug of choice. Um, and we'd go down and visit him in the tunnel and he'd show us around. And um, it was surreal and weird and, 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 and gross at times. But um, having really good, healthy boundaries and, you know, I mean, we would take him to a uh, buffet, you know, and just watching him get some nourishment was, it was just the little wonderful things um, that, that can happen when you love an addict. Thank you for that, Crystal. We have yeah. family members here today that have their loved ones homeless on the streets right now. So that, that gives a good insight. Thank you. Yeah, I, I have to say, I responded to this Facebook a group of people who had loved ones in tunnels and somebody said how could you let your father do that and I'm, I'm not gonna let him do anything right I mean that was his choice it, I would rack my brain thinking of things that I could do to help uh but he you know that's that's the he's a that's his hula hoop I, I can't violate his the sanctity of his boundaries um, even though I know it would be better for him or helpful for him. And so I just have to love him where he is. Yeah. Hard, hard, hard. It um, is. And and please unmute anybody who wants to ask a question and talk to Dr. Collier directly, please do. But there's another question in the chat by Allison, how to help my son who is heading to rehab next month. He is mostly in action stage, but self-doubt and fear creeps in sometimes. 
Right. So to be able to say, tell me about your self-doubt. Tell me about your fear. Let him get that energy out of his body. And for you, get into recovery. Please have your own program if you don't already. Because remember, we're included in these little systems, right? And think about the family system as like a child's mobile, right? And we all move interdependent, but we're all attached to this kind of energy that creates homeostasis. And when one person starts to use, it brings the homeostasis down, but it keeps going. Like we keep going. It's, you know, step, uh, just cattywampus. If you can get into your own recovery, you put pressure on that homeostatic balance and that has an effect there without actually having a direct effect. Knowing what recovery looks like for you, it, because codependency can be as deadly of a disease as addiction, right? I mean, I have watched people help people to death. So please know what your recovery looks like and keep healthy, healthy boundaries. Yes. And somebody asked, they sent me a private message about Marinon, the website. So what I did, um, if somebody could put the Marinon uh, link in the chat, but I also put the link to the Every Brain Matters Family Recovery Resources. You'll find articles there written by Dr. Collier and her levels of uh, stages of addiction. And you'll th there's a button there that'll lead you to the Marinon website too. So I just put it all in one so you guys have that link. Okay, lots of appreciation and thanks. Oh, good, good, good. I just want to say one last thing that if you know if you are a family member struggling with somebody who has addiction, especially marijuana addiction, marijuana robs us of our motivation. It robs us of our memory. It it's just such a, a, a tough drug because it, you know it's not meth. It's not heroin. It you know it looks very very different, but it really robs you of your family member. My heart goes to out to you. I feel your pain um, in many, many ways. And, and if I can do anything to love on you and support you and whatever you need, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you for that, Crystal. You got it. Yeah. Um, I do have one last question, unless somebody else, I don't want to talk over anybody. Um, please unmute or raise your hand if you have a question. Um, I know the five-year mark is like a magic mark where you talked about there's about a 15% chance of relapse at that stage. And that's with substance use disorder or somebody who has addiction. Our families are experiencing not only the cannabis use disorder, but the cannabis induced psychosis and the hyperemesis and the psychosis is, I mean, the marijuana is altering who they are, but then when the psychosis kicks in, it's really altering who they are. And then our fear bubbles up even more because they're not living in a state of reality at all. It's more like they go from this illusion to just complete hallucinations and stuff. Um, and I, I don't know if there's any research on relapsing when psychosis is part of the equation too. You know, Aubrey, this is so, I mean, in many cases, it's 5,000 times more potent than the marijuana that was grown organically in the 60s. And so we have a generation of young people whose brains are being experimented on. And I don't have great news here. The cases that I'm working on that have CIP, I am not seeing a lot of them come back 100%. I'm seeing a lot of them come back maybe 60, 80, 90%. And some kids who are going to need lifelong mental health care. And so I think this is, it's flipping the stage of zip change onto the parent is, and I hate to, to, I hate to say something that might cause a parent to lose hope. I don't want you to lose hope, but to understand that you may have to switch. I've been working with a family here in Houston for about four years, and they have taken their kid to so many different psychiatrists and He's getting a schizoid um, affective disorder, a schizoid personality, all kinds of diagnoses, but that really is um, uh, cannabis-induced psychosis that has permanently changed his brain. And so, and he didn't use very much, um, sadly. And so I think understanding that you may need more help. You may have a, a, a kid who becomes more dependent upon you than you ever dreamed or wanted, um, but know that you're not alone for that. 
and that there are more and more resources that are popping up as this becomes unfortunately more prevalent, but even more important to intervene as much as you can. And I think Aubrey is a great example of that because you moved to a different state to help make sure that your son got help. And even though he still struggles with many things today, you kept his frontal lobe on long enough to grow to a potential that is helping him function in the way that he's functioning today. And, um, you know, those little increments of, of health and safety are important to cultivate. Oh, thank you. I, I got lucky getting connected to the Houston model. There's a lot of recovery in Houston and which was not available in Colorado. And I recognize that a lot of, a lot of places just don't have that solid foundation of recovery. So that's why it's important what we're doing here, bringing Dr. Collier's uh, tools and resources to a broader audience. And, um, and so we can do that. Also, I encourage family members that we recognize that our, our loved ones are being experimented on and it's not good. And, and what can we do as family members who maybe, you know, we're further down the road and then we're going to have more people, unfortunately, joining us. What can we do to connect with those families, reach out to those families, work with the professionals to say, hey, this is what worked for me. This is how I coped. This is how I survived. So I didn't have to lose my health in the process too. Um, if um, So we need to start thinking about that and coming more together as a community so we can um, provide that foundation and those resources for these families. So, um, so Seymour has a hand. Does, oh. Did you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, I'm hearing talks about going elsewhere for therapy. I, I'm from Columbus, Ohio, and not not very much here. I'm not very impressed with um, the PHP and IOP program that he's in now, but he's, I think he's in the pre-contemplation phase. Um, I think he's starting to slip into contemplation now. So that was very helpful for me. What are your thoughts on, this is where I struggle with, and I, I don't know what the answer is, and you as a professional can help me, um, sending them out of state to another recovery um, program and then bringing them back. What my fear is that we're sending him away, away from all the influences, but eventually he has to return back and there's those influence around him. Okay. Does that make sense? So it makes a lot of sense. And I always try to ask a kid, how many using friends do you have? If they say that almost all my friends are using, I always recommend going out of state and staying out of state. There are so many great treatment centers that are also connected to uh, PHPs, IOPs, sober living. What we want is a sober living facility if we can get it. And, and if they're under age, you may have to move with them. I mean, whatever you can do to keep that frontal lobe on as long as you can possibly keep it on, because re as you heard, relapse rates are incredibly high. And uh, how old? 16, I think you said? Was it 16? No, he's 20. He's oh, 20. sorry, 20. So, uh, depending on how long he's been using and what kind of arrested development that he has, right? He may not have the impulse control of a 20 year old. He may have no. the impulse control right of a 16 year old. And yes, so exactly. Yeah. Doing what you can to support him not coming back is okay. the best thing you can do. And I have to say that was the case for me. I was um, 18 when I got sober, I moved to uh, Omaha, Nebraska. It was the best thing for me. And I stayed there for my first six years of recovery and had a beautiful recovery network there. So sending him to a, a, a place where there are young people his age that he can live with, that he can grow with, that he can get uh, sponsorship from, it is one of the best things you can do. Bringing him back, huge chance for relapse. So you're, you're, the way you're thinking is spot on. Okay, thank you so much. Crystal, another question, and I think maybe we need to have a different webinar just for this topic. Okay. A lot of these youth recovery programs uh, think nicotine is a harm reduction drug for the recovery process. And now that the nicotine is in these vapes and is really high concentrated, potent, um, is that, I mean, that, I don't necessarily agree that that's a harm reduction approach, approach for a developing brain. I have to say, I've never heard of it being used in that fashion as a harm reduction technique, but it's a battle that is not the most important battle to fight, 
like, you know, because, because nicotine does not cause intoxication, it is the most addictive drug on the face of the earth. But as you guys heard, uh, you know, I didn't quit until I was uh, 20, uh, in my 20s. I kept, you know, I, my doctor actually told me, don't stop, quit, don't stop smoking for at least your first two years of sobriety, because he knew how stressful it is to quit smoking and how it causes such stress that can lead to relapse on drugs or alcohol. So it's just not a battle. I think that parents should fight. There are so many, you can't use under a certain age anyway. So there are treatment centers that won't let you do it, which is a bonus is if you can get a kid in a treatment center and they go through uh, smoking cessation withdrawals and whatever else withdrawals they're on in one scoop, but remember, they're you know they may go right back out to nicotine when they finish. Again, a battle that I would not fight until later on, until somebody is in a different stage of. Each drug will have a different stage of change. Okay. Any more questions? Comments. This is an excellent webinar. I'm so awesome. Oh, good, good. Thank you so much. I'll, I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing you guys next week. We'll go into this, you know, even a deeper dive and uh, please feel free to bring some questions then too. Thank you guys so much. Thank for you having so much. Me. Thank you, fantastic. Dr. Collier. It was fantastic. Great job. Yes. Excellent webinar. And thank you everybody for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of your day.